All right, come on in, grab a seat. We're going to get started this morning. Let me today uh, begin by welcoming you to another gathering of Lebanon Baptist Church. We're so glad that you have come to worship Jesus Christ with us today. Um, if you are visiting uh, today, we want to welcome you particularly. And uh, if you are interested in receiving some information about our church, allowing us to communicate with you, uh, there's a barcode in the chair in front of you. Just scan it at some point and fill that out. We would love to interact with you and tell you about what God is doing here and would love for you to uh, even consider partnering with us as we continue to uh, proclaim Jesus Christ to this particular community. Got a few announcements for you, uh, but first let me tell you that today is a special day at our church. Uh, every once in a while we devote a Sunday or a weekend or even a few days for a missions emphasis and where we will remind ourselves of what we are to give ourselves to. We as uh, God's people, even though we have the Spirit of God in us, when we accepted Christ as our Savior, we are so prone to forget about what we are called to do. And that is to spread the name of Jesus to the ends of the world. And today we have devoted uh, the morning, uh, our Sunday school hour, uh, this hour, and then this evening to really uh, regalvanize our church to this great task ahead of us, and that is to get the gospel to the world. And so we're glad that you're here today. Uh, with that, we have an evening gathering, and that is at 5 o'clock tonight, and Pastor Josh is going to be sharing how God has been working in his life, particularly in reference to taking the gospel to Utah. And so you want to be here tonight. Uh, one of the things that we're going to do special this evening is after our gathering, we are going to have a kind of a church pizza party. Now some of you are saying, like, where are we going to go? Because we don't have a fellowship hall. Well, uh, we'll have you just scatter through the building for pizza. But we do want to know if you're coming, so we order enough pizza. And so many of you got a, uh, you signed up online already. You got an email about it. But if you're interested, I think... Uh, uh, follow that link. If you're visiting today and you still want to come and you're not sure what to do, you can check out our website or you can just catch one of our pastors after the service and we'll get you signed up for it. And, uh, but we want to know by 1 o'clock today so we make sure that we order enough food. And so trust you'll be here 5 o'clock tonight after the service. We'll have that pizza and, uh, and we'll just rejoice in what God is doing in, uh, within our church. Also, uh, next Saturday, there is a men's uh, prayer breakfast. It was just real interesting. A couple of men in our church started getting burdened about, hey, could we do a, a men's prayer breakfast again? We used to do them a while back. And so uh, we love when our people are desiring to just continue to reach out into, uh, the, into our church family. And so uh, we were just excited about it. It says, yeah, we'll love for you guys to do that. And so uh, they're doing that uh, this coming Saturday. And so men, if you're free, uh, that's at uh, 8 o'clock. It'll go till about 9.30. You can sign up on our church website. There'll be food, testimonies, and a challenge. And of course, this is not just for our men, but also for our young men, our boys, uh, they're welcome to come and be a part of that as well. Uh, also, we've been telling you about a new church app that we are going to be uh, uh, really focusing our congregation on all of us downloading and utilizing. It's called Church Center. You can scan this code. What we need you to do is, as soon as possible, particularly if you're a member here, is to download it. Uh, you can do it today by following that code. Uh, right now, we're trying to work on getting all of our church members to upload personal pictures of themselves just for our directory, as well as you can add a family photo. We do ask that you don't, like, do your picture as your pet or anything like that, because that's not helping our church family know who you are, okay? And so, uh, if you could, uh, as you log on, start adding those in, and we look forward to uh, what God's going to do there. And then, finally, VBS. I know we're a long way away from that, 
uh, but not too long. That's going to be in June, and it's K-4 through 6th grade, and we are already starting to look for volunteers who will commit that week to serving. I know a lot of you make vacation plans, but we'd love for you to be a part of that. You can sign up in the Church Center app to be a part of that. Well, I'm, uh, for those of you who are just showing up, uh, you, uh, you may have missed just a, a real neat advertisement. I trust that maybe if you weren't here at 9.30, that you'll go back and listen to it. And uh, Tim Pulver presented what God is doing in ball ground in reference to a church plant there that our church is being a part of. And uh, it was just exciting to hear what God's doing. And so let me encourage you to go back and listen to that. And then this morning, we're going to focus on this idea of churches planting other churches. And then this evening, uh, the whole day is geared for that. And I trust this will be a wonderful encouragement to you. So, Mark, you come and start our service. The theme for our gathering this morning is that Jesus is worthy of all of our worship. And our call to worship comes from Revelation chapter 5. And as we read this together, we're going to read this passage of Scripture responsively. Uh, if you see on the screen leader, that's me reading. But if you see the word congregation, that's where we'd invite you all to join in as we read Revelation 5 together. This is a very special passage the Apostle John says he was in the Spirit, and the Spirit of God took him into the throne room of heaven. And John wrote these words in Revelation 5. He said these words, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and a golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked. And I heard around the throne and around the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Let's pray together. Father, we come before your presence this morning. And Father, we, by your Holy Spirit, want to see a picture of you like John saw. Lord, today, we want to see Jesus reigning 
as the lamb who was slain. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son Jesus that you gave to us so freely that he would die for our sins, be buried, and then rise on the third day so that we, who put our faith and trust in him, might have everlasting life. Thank you, Father, that it was your good plan to include in the history of redemption all peoples from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And Lord, we look forward to that day when we stand in your presence and we fall down and worship. But as we sing today and as we're gathered as your people now, we understand that we get a little taste of that this morning. So Lord, be honored by our voices, be honored in our prayers, be honored as the word is preached and spoken and as we respond to it. We pray that everything would be done this morning in our gathering to show that Jesus is worthy. And it's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Let's all stand together and we'll begin singing Glorious and Mighty. Majesty glory shining brighter than the moon and the stars harmony we honor and fear you above all gods glorious and mighty your awesome in beauty joyful that Jesus is worthy. He is worthy of all of our worship. Let's sing together. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But did you know dark won't stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made we do it's all 
creation groaning it is it's a new creation coming it is it's the glory of the lord to be the light within our midst it is is it good that we remind ourselves
Thank you. You may be seated. For those of you in this room who have experienced two births, your birth into just life, physical life, and then those of you who have been born by the Spirit, which means at some point in your life, you have chosen and believed in Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And you have turned your back on your own self and you've chosen to follow him. If that is the case for you, the Bible has given you two commands. One is to identify him through baptism. That you would follow the Lord in that way to identify with his people. But a second command, now of course he's given you many commands, but the second command or ordinance that he's given you is that you would participate in what we are doing this morning that we call the Lord's table or the Lord's supper. And in fact, uh, he reiterated the command in reference to this to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. He says this, For I received from the Lord... What I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment to himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So what we're doing this morning is we are following Jesus' commands. The bread, of course, symbolizes his body that was broken for us, and the juice symbolizes his blood. He died once for all. This this bread and this cup don't actually become Jesus' body and his blood. These are just pictures of this. You receive grace from Jesus Christ the moment you receive him, and of course, you get all the grace that comes through him. And so today, we are going to remind ourselves of this. If you are investigating Jesus right now, and maybe you're not a follower of him, let me just ask that today you just pass the elements by you and just uh, watch us, okay? Uh, we hope that you will see within this community a group of people who are followers of Jesus. But if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, we invite you to partake. And of course, you do it in a self-examining type way. Let me encourage you to do that. And uh, when, uh, just practically, when we pass these uh, they all have, the cup on the bottom has the bread and the cup on the top has the juice, so make sure you grab both of them. Okay, so would you join me as I thank the Lord for what he's given for us, and then our men are going to come and distribute. Let's pray. Father, we are reminded again here at the beginning of the month of all that you've provided for us in Jesus. And now as we partake of uh, your blessed the truths of your blessed body and, and blood that was given for us, as we partake of these elements, would you help us to remember what you have done for us many years ago and what you will do for us in the future. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You come then. As the men prepare to distribute the cup and the bread, we're going to sing together as a congregation of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. There is a fountain. Let's sing. Sinners 
Jesus Christ took on human flesh permanently so that he could give his life for us. And he broke that body so that we could have life. So take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. He broke his body. And then he shed his blood. Five bleeding wounds he bore. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from what? All sin. I can stand here today telling you that all my sin, all my past sin, my present sin, and all my future sin was all on Jesus on the cross. And you may be here today, and you may have come from a week, and you've accepted Christ, but you've fallen into sin. Let me tell you, if any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so you can come today and, and just rejoice in it. Okay? So this is the new cup, the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink. Hallelujah, what a Savior. 
I often remind you on this Sunday as we often take, and really it's not a special offering when it comes to, we're not going to pass plates or anything, but I always remind you of our benevolence fund. You can just do this online. You can designate to our benevolence fund. This is to help needy people within our church and outside of our church when it comes to helping them go through difficult times. And we always remind you of this fund. I also want to remind you that today, because it is a missions emphasis Sunday, that we are also encouraging you to give toward a mission conference fund. And that fund, just so you know, everything that comes into it is going to be given to help with Tim Pulver, and as you'll hear tonight with Josh Rowland, just some things when it comes to their church planting efforts. And so this is exciting, uh, going toward their support and to further God's work. So if you give to this, let me encourage all of you to do this. We normally have two missions emphasis, either days or weekends. We'll do another one in August. But let me encourage you, if you've been setting aside some funds for missions, that you would give toward that fund today. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a little bit, but let's continue to worship the Lord. Early on in Jesus' ministry, the crowds who were following him thought that following him would be a wonderful thing. They thought that Jesus was come to earth and in that moment was going to set up his kingdom. He was going to throw off Roman oppression and rule. And they thought following Jesus might be a good thing until Jesus started likening following him to taking up a cross. And he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And it was then that when Jesus was saying those words that many of the crowds began to forsake him. Because taking up a cross didn't sound really nice. But for those of us who know who Jesus is, that he is the supreme treasure of heaven, and he is worth everything, to take up a cross and deny ourselves is something that makes sense. Because when we lose our life for his sake, we find it. And this next song that we're going to sing together is entitled, I Want to Know You. I love the chorus. It says, I trade my treasure and all my reward, Jesus, to know you, then know you more. Let's stand together and sing.
Miss our kids K4 through the second grade out the back doors. You may be seated. Parents, if you're new to our gathering, you can pick up your children right across the hallway at the conclusion of our time together. Thank you. I have to open my message today with an apology. Many of you know a number of weeks ago I began to open up Romans 9 to you and told you to stick with me. We're going to have to make our way through Romans 9, 10, and 11. And then we've been away from it for three weeks. And uh, I'll tell you, we are going to be back in Romans 9 next week. Okay, so buckle your seatbelt. We are exploring some amazing truths in that particular area of Romans However, today, because of it being a Missions Emphasis Sunday, I want to focus our attention on a particular topic. We are going to look at today what we would call purposeful multiplication. And that's this, that we would be a church that is equipping and sending believers to spread the gospel to the world by establishing local churches. If you're a member here at Lebanon, you'll know that uh, we have a mission statement, but we also have a vision statement. And if we're fulfilling our, you could say, mission, what is our vision? What will happen? And, uh, And that is this, that we would reproduce ourselves by sending our own to plant churches in Atlanta, the Salt Lake Valley, Indonesia, and the world. And I'll tell you this, it is happening. God is doing, as we as a church are giving ourselves to this, it's happening. You've seen it already in Sunday school this morning. You're going to hear about it tonight. And so today I want to first of all pray and then ask God to help us as we look at this exciting topic. Join me as I pray. Father, today as we are reminded of the task that you have placed in front of us as churches, and particularly as Lebanon Baptist Church, that you would help today for us to have a renewed understanding and vision of what you have called us as individuals and as a corporate body to be engaged in. Father, I confess that we are people that are so often tempted to be involved in every other type of business, and many of them are very temporal and have no eternal value. But Father, I ask today that you would again incline our hearts and allow us to catch the vision that Jesus gave there on those, that mountain in Galilee where he called them to make disciples to the ends of the earth. Guide us to this end in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the first questions you ask somebody when you meet them is, so what do you do? 
What are you involved in? What kind of occupation do you have? It's just a normal thing. Normally you go from there, it's like, where are you from? But what do you do? What are you involved in? What type of business do you work in? As I look across and span our audience today, there's a variety of different businesses that you are engaged in. Some of you uh, work a particular job, but then you also have a side business, or some of you have multiple businesses. I've told you how my first two businesses were I sold giant bubble makers, and then I was a marketer for Beanie Babies during the great craze. That's how I bought my first car, and that's how I bought my engagement ring. Okay. But I'm looking at a number of you who have been involved in business, and uh, you identify in that particular way. There is one common business that every member of Lebanon Baptist Church and every member of Jesus Christ Universal Church should be involved in. In fact, it should be your main business. If this business is not on your radar, then we have a problem here. And it's this. Churches ought and should and must plant other churches. That's my business, and that should be your business. So if you're here today and you're, you work in healthcare, maybe you're a doctor, maybe you're a nurse, that's your business. That's one of your businesses. You are also involved in the main business of helping churches get planted. If you're a businessman or businesswoman in here, you may do that for 50, 60, 80 hours a week. That's one of your businesses. Another business that you ought to not just be moonlighting on, but maybe you could say sunlighting on, is you ought to be planting churches. You ought to be engaged in some way in the factory of helping churches get planted. If you're a stay-at-home mom, you ought to be helping your church plant other churches. To explain this and to support what I'm saying, I am going to involve one who we've involved oftentimes, and that's the Apostle Paul. Paul is one who talks much about this, and today I'm going to do something a little bit different. Many of you know I normally like to park in one text of Scripture and just stay there the entire time, but today I would like to look at three texts. All of them are close in your Bible. We're going to look, first of all, at Ephesians 2, so let me invite you to turn there, and I am going to show you how Paul explains God's plan for multiplication. Why was this his plan? Okay, And really, we're going to talk there about the design of the church. And then I'm going to take you to Acts, and I'm going to show you how Luke, through the Apostle Paul's work, gives you the process of multiplication. So you'll see the plan, you'll see the process of multiplication, and how it took place in the early church, and then I'm going to take you, yeah, to Romans, okay? We're going to get to Romans, but we're going to be at the end of Romans, and I'm going to show you how Paul personally is involved in church multiplication and how you are the people that ought to be engaged in this great task. So to begin with, we're going to look at, first of all, the plan. The plan is this. Churches planted everywhere. That's God's plan. That's what he wants to happen. You know, it goes without saying that you and I live in a world that is in desperate need of help. As I was reminded in college, the most sobering reality in the world today is that people are dying and going to hell today. And we know, if you're a believer, if they don't see and they don't come to follow Jesus Christ, they are damned. The Bible says this, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given among men whereby you must be saved. So in order for people on this planet to go to heaven, 
they have to meet and come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. But Jesus is no longer bodily on this earth. As we know, he's seated at the right hand of God. He's in heaven. So how does this lost and dying world see and meet Jesus? How do they do it? Well, if you remember in the Old Testament, one of the ways that they were to see and get a visual idea of God in his presence was the tabernacle. The tabernacle was, to, was designed, it was a tent that was designed to just picture the work of God and what he was going to do, and that led to the second kind of presence of God, and that was the temple that was built in Jerusalem that really the world was supposed to come and see through the nation of Israel the presence of God But then, God chose to tabernacle among us, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And for 33, we believe, years, the temple of God, in fact, none other than God himself, graced this planet. And he lived his life in front of men. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, Jesus. He has made him fully known. And that's why he could tell his disciples, show us, when they said, show us the Father, and it will suffice us. Have I been with you so long? If you have seen me, you have seen who? You've seen the Father. But He died, he rose again triumphantly, and then he ascended into heaven. How do people get to see Jesus today? God's design is that people would see Jesus through his church, through his people. In fact, did you know that he even calls the church Local churches, the universal church, he calls them the body of who? Christ. That's why you remember when Jesus confronted Paul on his road to Damascus, and he had been, Paul, persecuting different people who were part of the church and had been throwing them into prison and killing them, and he confronts them and he says, why are you persecuting who? Me. It's an affront on him. The church is him. The church is his body on earth. We are to be his representation to this world. We are to display him to this generation. And that is what's found in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians 2, I don't have time to give you all the context, but Paul is talking to a local church that's made up of Jews and Gentiles who had placed their faith in Jesus Christ. They were a church. And in this particular text, he tells them the church's purpose. I want you to look what it says in Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. He says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, And members of the household of God, you are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into, here it is, a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. In fact, what he's saying is this. He's saying that the church of Jesus Christ, the individual members, you are God's temple. You are to be, you could say, the visual display to the lost and dying world of what it means to know God. By this, 
shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. They ought to look at God's people and see what it means to be a part of God's family. So the church is God's dwelling place. It is the temple where people see God. Not only that, the church also functions as a visual reminder Not only to this world, so we have a lost and dying world who are watching us, but did you know that there's a whole other dimension that you and I don't see that are watching this? And that is what we call the angelic world, the principalities and powers. And he says, he adds to this, that you are not only a display to a lost and dying world, but you are also on display to the angelic world of what God is doing in this world. In fact, go to chapter 3 of Ephesians, and he says this in verse 10. He says, So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So he's basically saying that the church is on display to that particular sphere to show them that, guess what? Jesus Christ won, and he is going to bring everything under his feet. He is going to restore creation. I often used, years ago, I hadn't used it in a while because I used it a lot, an illustration about the demolition derby. You and I are all like, Stolen cars in the demolition derby of life. We stole our own car and we lived our lives denting other people and enjoying it. And finally, after living a life in the demolition derby of life, someone said, that car right there, take it to the dump and put it into the incinerator. And here you are, you've been picked up They're about to drop you in to the incinerator. Visions of Toy Story 3 or whatever uh, come to your mind, and you are about to be lost forever. And about that time, someone pulls onto the property and says, Stop. I want to buy that car back. And they buy you, and they purchase you and make you their own, And then they begin to restore you back to your mint condition. And what I often told you is you're like like that transport vehicle where, you know what, we're all a bunch of cars that got put on this transport vehicle, but we're all in different stages of this remodeling process, and we're being driven through town, and people people who live in the demolition derby of life are like, man, I remember denting that person, but look at They got a new hood. They got a new fender. Man, they're looking good. Their engines, God's doing something there. And you and I, the church, are on display to a lost and dying world, and not only to this dimension, but to the dimension beyond, to show Satan and his hordes he lost. And God is going to redeem and restore fallen people into the likeness of his son. That's the church. The church is that transport vehicle on the way to heaven. And you and I are displaying him. So you could say that Lebanon Baptist Church is like a display, a trophy case of God's grace. That we are, to be, we are planted in the middle of Roswell to show this world what it means to be a follower of Christ and changed by God's grace. So Lebanon Baptist Church, if you want to see God's presence, if you want to see God's plan, if you want to see God's power, what should happen is you ought to look in the church. And we ought to be changing and becoming more like him. This is what the world needs to see. And churches must plant other churches so that God's display of what he's doing is everywhere in the world. Did Jesus not want this? In fact, his last command, what did he say? Go into what? All the world and preach the gospel. I mean, make disciples. 
Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. You and I are supposed to help the gospel go forth so that as we see individuals get saved, they organize themselves into churches, and the churches are to be display cases in wherever they are in the world to the work of God. So consider just a town in Utah. Consider American Fork, Utah. Small little town outside of Provo. Does it need the gospel? I'll tell you it does. Let's say an individual believer lives there. What is he supposed to do? I mean, ultimately, he's supposed to evangelize. He's supposed to tell people about Jesus. And hopefully that one believer leads to what? Two believers. And soon what happens is that group begins to function as a church. Believers develop in that local church, and before long, guess what? God's glory is being displayed. In fact, people can start seeing God's presence and plans and power through that church. Let me say, Utah need, needs churches. All, there's so many places in this world that need churches. I mean, imagine if, if every local church was like a lighthouse. And it was pitch black outside, and every church was one lighthouse. And let's say that you were able to look at the, the map of the world at night, and you were to see where the churches are. Can you have enough? No, you want, you want those churches everywhere lit up so they can display the name of Jesus to the entire world. God's work moves forward as local churches plant local churches. You see this in U.S. history. Do you know in, in 1776, 17% of the U.S. population, they say, were religious adherents. In 1820, okay, so move for a few years, there was one church for every 875 residents. So, but then around the time of the Civil War and up through 1906, there was a great push to plant churches in the United States. Churches were planted and what happened was it became that there was one church planted for every 430 people. What happened? Around 1916, the religious adherence at that point was at 53%. You plant churches, the light gets displayed, the, God's glory is on display, the more. However, after World War I, church planting plummeted. There became turf wars, there was complacency, no assimilation, we, they were just kind of like, hold the fort. Let me just say, historically, when you plant a church, churches, by nature of being a church plant, have to focus on evangelism. So as they're planting the church in ball ground, if they're going to grow, they're going to have to tell people about Jesus. We here, even in Roswell, we can get satisfied, oh, there's, there's going to be people here on Sunday. And we can get real self-satisfied with, hey, there, there's, there's a number of Christians coming, but you know what? When you plant a church, oftentimes in your mind, you're like, i got to tell people about Jesus. So that's one of the reasons why we keep planting churches. Because we want us to be focused on evangelism. In fact, new church plants oftentimes reach new generations, new residents, new people groups. They say that church plants appeal to the religiously unattached. That they say in reference to just percentages that 60 to 80% of planted churches members were not attending church before. So this is a good thing. Now, some of you may say, hey, 
Let's not plant because there's plenty of room. I mean, you got these sections over here. We don't need to plant, Pastor Brian. We don't, we're, we're good here. But let me just say, new churches foster evangelism. New ideas. They train new leaders. And we need more light. And that's why we're not just satisfied here in Atlanta. We want to take it to some, one of the darkest places in our nation, Utah. And we want to take it to one of the darkest places, Indonesia. But we don't want to stop there. We're willing to do the whole world. The only reason we've picked some of these places is so that we could just get focused for a time on helping us to do this. So we need churches everywhere. That's God's plan. It's how people see Jesus. So that's the plan. Now you say, now, Pastor Brian, how does that occur? What's the process? Now I want you to go to Acts for a moment. Go to the book of Acts. Turn to Acts chapter 11. The process is this. Church, uh, churches plant churches. Of course, the book of Acts, by way of introduction, is the history book of the church, the early church. In fact, the church started with just one church, one local church in the city of Jerusalem. However, persecution came and the believers began to disperse, and other churches began to get started as the gospel spread. In fact, look what it says in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 21. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenist also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believe turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. So you catch this? What happened was the church started telling people about Jesus. They evangelized. And it's interesting, oftentimes it's in the midst of persecution and hard times that God's people get motivated to do that. So there was great persecution. The gospel went forth. They evangelized in this town called Antioch. They started gathering. And Jerusalem heard about it. And they sent someone who had been trained, at least, to go help. They sent this guy named Barnabas. And it says this in verse 23 of that same chapter. It says, And when he, Barnabas, came and he saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with a steadfast purpose. And then what Barnabas does is he says, Man, these guys, they could really utilize Paul. He could be a real blessing to this assembly at this particular time. And so he goes and gets Paul, and look what it says in verse 25. It says, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Paul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with, here it is, the church. And taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So there was just some believers there. Now they're a what? They're a church. And they have leaders that's what existing churches should do. Help churches get started. Everybody doing their part. In fact, you go to, go, to verse, uh, go to chapter 13 of Acts. This is a number of months later. It says this, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. Now there, they had been gathered. There were not only prophets, there were teachers. There were different people doing various things task within that, that assembly. There was leadership that had developed. They no doubt had begun to use their gifts. They were devoting themselves to prayer and to fasting. And what happened to that church? That church got led to send out some of their own. Look what it says at the end of the verse, or in verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, 
Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And so what do they do? That church now is sending their own to go plant churches in other spots. So all of you in this room who are part of Lebanon Baptist Church, our job is to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to do our part. All of us should be looking to ways to be to the common good of this assembly, engage ourselves in ministering all the one another's to one another, investing our gifts, our resources, and everything in the work of Jesus Christ. And what will happen is over time, God will raise up some from our own to take the gospel to new spots. And two men were moved by God to do that, and the church sends them out to evangelize and plant more churches. And if you were to follow along in Acts chapter 13 and 14, Paul and Barnabas go and evangelize in Cyprus and Asia Minor, and they plant churches in Antioch, Pisidia, in Iconium, in Lystra, in Derbe, in Perga. And you know what they do in all those churches? They not only gather believers, they begin to establish leadership. Go to chapter 14 for a moment. In chapter 14, look what it says in verse 21 through 23. And when they had preached the gospel in that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations they must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and with fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So they, they establish elders, pastors in each of the, the churches, and after their big trip, they come back to the mother church there in Antioch, and they report. Look what it says in verse 27 and 28 of chapter 14. And when they had arrived, they gathered the church together, and they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they remained no little time with the disciples. So do they stop there? Hey, we got those churches planted in Asia Minor, we're good. No, they don't stop. They said, hey, now let's go encourage those churches. And so in chapter 15, verse 36, listen to what Paul says, and after some days... Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. So they go and visit all those churches, but they don't stop there. They go and plant churches in Philippi, Troas, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, and of course a church would later get planted in Rome. You know what the pattern is? Local churches plant local churches. And it is interesting as well that Paul oftentimes goes to the urban centers. He goes into the cities. And he plants there because the gospel goes from the cities out. And I'll tell you this, like Ball Ground, Ball Ground's part of Atlanta. It's a big city. It's just, Atlanta's just continuing to grow. And it's just the gospel goes out into the, the highways and byways of life. One of the examples of that is the, they planted a church in the city of Ephesus, which was one of the main cities in Asia Minor. And as a result of the gospel getting planted in Ephesus, that gospel spread out through the Lycus Valley. In fact, from Ephesus, no doubt, Laodicea got planted Colossi, the church at Colossi got planted, and also Areopolis got planted. Churches plant churches, focus oftentimes on cities, the more the better. We ought to train, 
We ought to work at training all of our people to be leaders and grow in grace and be a part of the family business. Because whose business is this? This is God's business, to display his glory to the world. And that brings me to the final point, and it's this, the people. Who are the people who are involved in that? We've already seen the plan, which is churches planted everywhere. We've seen the process, churches plant churches. And then I want you to see the people, and it's this, everybody doing your part. Now I want you to turn to Romans 15 for a moment. Romans 15, in this particular section of Romans, Paul expresses to a church that he hadn't planted. He, this was a church that evidently the gospel had, other people had planted this church, but he's talking to them and he's expressing to them his passion to see more churches planted. In fact, he's writing this whole book, as we've discovered, to encourage their faith and also to help more Gentiles come to faith. In fact, look what he says in verse 15 and 16 of chapter 15. He says this, But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace that was given by God to me to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What's happening here is this. Paul is telling you that God had put a specific calling on him. Many of you know when he got called into God's family, he had given him a specific gift. And his particular gift was he was called by God to take the gospel, not simply to the Jews, but to the Gentiles and to kings. And when he embraced what God called him to do, He's telling them, you know what? My calling is to help the Gentiles come to Christ to offer them as an offering to God because this is what he's called me to do. I want to live and do my part in what God has put me into the assembly line to do. And he saw the discipleship of the Gentiles as his spiritual service to the Lord as offering. But he glorified not in what he did, but actually what God was doing through him. In fact, look what he says now in verse 17. He says this, In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and by deed, by the power of signs and wonders, and by the power of the Spirit of God. So what he's basically saying is this. You know what? God has done some great work, but I'm not glorying in what I have done, but it's what he's doing through me. And then he says something incredible. Look what he says at the end of verse 19. He says, So that from Jerusalem... And all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Now you say, Pastor Brian, I know where Jerusalem is. I have no idea where Illyricum is. Paul is saying this, from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel. Does that mean that Paul had preached the gospel to every person? No. He hadn't engaged every single person there. But he said that the gospel was fully preached all the way to Illyricum. We believe that Illyricum was where modern-day Serbia, Croatia, Albania are. We don't know actually when the Apostle Paul got there because you look at his journeys, it could have been a part of his third missionary journey that he jetted up there for a time. But what I believe is happening is here, he can say that with a conscience clean. Why? Because I believe there had been churches that had been planted in there, and there were now lighthouses that the gospel was going forth to those communities. He says, I have fully preached the gospel all the way from Jerusalem to Illyricum. 
I've done my job. Paul, that was his, he was a foundation layer. He was one of the early apostles who helped lay the work down. He desired, of course, he wanted to preach the gospel where Christ was not named. In fact, go to the next verse, verse 20. He says this, And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have, not, have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard him will understand. Now, this was not him against helping existing churches. I mean, him writing Romans is a whole illustration of him helping other churches come established in the faith. He didn't plant the church at Rome. However, he was continually desirous to get the gospel to unreached places. In fact, he finishes his letter by saying, I got another place I want to go. Look what he says now in verse 22. For this reason, why I have so often been hindered from coming to you, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing. <laughs> as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. So what is he basically saying? He says, you know what? I want to keep going. I want to keep going. I want to take the gospel to Spain. He didn't give up. I mean, one of the things I've appreciated so much about our dear Dick Hester one of our pastors, is, I mean, many of you know he named his, uh, I think he named his first pacemaker, Caleb. Why did he name it Caleb? Because, uh, or you know, the first one was uh, Hezekiah. Because he got one in his late 40s, and he says, I want 15 more years to live for the Lord. Give me 15 more years. And then he got another pacemaker, and it was Caleb. And many of you know Caleb, even at an at an older age, he wanted the hardest places to go. And we've kind of joked that uh, the next pacemaker was Methuselah, okay? <laughs> and, but even one of the last times I visited him in the hospital, he just said, what can I do? What can I do? I mean, Marsh Milliken, who's now with the Lord, about a week before he passed off this planet, he calls me from his hospital bed. He says, how can I do another Bible study? And I'm like, mm, I don't know. He was like, I want to be able to teach some more people about these wonderful truths. Lebanon Baptist Church, you may not be the Apostle Paul that God gave you those gifts of apostleship, but he has given every one of you spiritual gifts and all of you are supposed to be a part of the assembly line for the sake of the gospel. You may think that you putting on the rearview mirror of the car is not important, but I'll tell you this, all of us know how important a rearview mirror is. I'm just, I'm just that little hubcap. Is that really important? The little dipstick. I'm not, every part is important. And every part needs to be fully engaged in what we are doing because we have a lost and dying world and we are to plant churches. Paul was gifted to do his part and you are gifted to do yours. How can you as a teen or a Sunday school teacher or a businessman play a role? You must. You must be a part of this family business. All things support this great enterprise. That means this, all of us naturally have to evangelize. I hope that you have people that right now you're learning their name. I, I've been writing down names. There's a server that I've run into who, Nadi, I want her to come to know the Lord. In Easton, in Gustavo, in Nicholas. Who are you seeking? to reach for the sake of the gospel. Do it here 
and then all of us work together to display God's glory to this community. And then let's just not be satisfied with just having it here. Let's be willing to release a, a family like the Pulvers and say, you know what, go and start another lighthouse in another area. We are to be a launching pad for the gospel's sake. Couples, be Aquila and Priscilla's. Aquila and Priscilla are just a simple tent-making couple who were part of almost every church at that point. It was said about this, young, this couple, Aquila and Priscilla, who were simply, you could say, laymen and laywomen in their church. All the churches of the Gentiles give thanks for them. Wow. What does that mean for you? It may mean that it may mean that you move to help a church get planted. It may involve equipping and training others here at this church to help them take the gospel to new places. We must do this until the gospel has gone to what? All nations. God uses churches and individuals to do his work. So Lebanon Baptist Church, we got an incredible family business, don't we? We got God's business. And you need to get involved. You know, it was over 75 years ago that a family business got started about 30 miles from here. In fact, it was during my first visit with my family when I came to uh, really candidate at Lebanon Baptist Church. We got off the airplane from uh, the famine of no Chick-fil-A in Wisconsin and we looked for the closest Chick-fil-A from the airport, and we stumbled into the little dwarf house, which was the very first Chick-fil-A 75 years ago. Now Chick-fil-A, that family business, has over 3,000 locations. And what do they simply do? They simply serve a really good chicken sandwich that satisfies your hunger for a few hours. They were purposeful, passionate, and strategic, and they've achieved great success. But let me tell you, we have a much more important business to be involved in. In fact, eternity is on the line. You and I are actually, in our church, is to display God's presence to a lost and dying world. So will you give your energy, your resources, and you find your part in the family business? Okay? There's nothing more exciting. Businessmen and businesswomen, there's nothing you want your kids to follow in more than this family business. So make sure that they see the passion of your life is not everything else, but the passion of your life is this. Will you leverage your time, your resources, your life to extend the gospel through church planning? Nothing more exciting, nothing more fulfilling. This is the family business. So Lebanon Baptist Church, let's be about purposeful multiplication, equipping and sending believers to spread the gospel to the world by establishing local churches. I close with this. If you have never embraced Jesus Christ, that's the first step you can ever do to even be a part of his family. Turn to Jesus Christ. If you need to talk to someone about that, let me encourage you to do that even today after the service. Let's be a part of this great enterprise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truths of this text. And as we prepare in just a moment to dismiss, Lord, help us to find our part and get involved in what you're trying to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Josh is going to come and share a little bit right before we leave. And let me encourage you all uh, to be back this evening. I do want to encourage you to come back tonight, uh, not just for the pizza, uh, but also for our time together uh, at 5 o'clock. And uh, if you, you should have gotten an email to help sign up for that pizza. Do that by 1 o'clock. That would be helpful for us. Um, but also, please come back so that I have somebody to talk to tonight. 
we, we would like to share with you tonight how the Lord has been uh, working and leading uh, in our family's life. And uh, we are extremely excited for what God is doing. And uh, the Gospel Grace Church and the family of churches out there, Gospel Hope, Gospel Peace, Gospel Light, uh, they're prepping for another Gospel Family Church plant. And they're pursuing us and our family to come out and be a part of this next church plant. And so we uh, have been praying about it, and we have said yes. And so we're looking at August as, as, our, t as our time frame for leaving. But we're going to talk about that tonight and let you know what God is doing in our family, cast some of the vision, let you know what's going on. Uh, but please come back tonight, hear all about it. Please pray for us and uh, join with us in this exciting venture of planting churches. And uh, we'll, we'll be excited to tell you all the details tonight. So let's pray and we'll be dismissed. And I hope to see you back tonight. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. Lord, I thank you that you are doing something in this world for your glory, for your purposes, these, these amazing purposes that are way bigger than we are. And yet you allow us to be a part of it. Father, I pray that our church would continue to raise up, continue to disciple, continue to see lost people come to know you as their Savior. And Lord, continue to send people out to start other churches. Lord, be with us this afternoon. Bless us on our way. Help us as we come back this evening. I pray that it would all be for your glory. Now to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom. Priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed.